Well, after more than a year in stasis, how about part two of the portable sound booth project? We jumped right back in where we left off last time. For ventilation, we planned to mount a computer fan to the lid, and we left a gap in the mass-loaded vinyl to allow for airflow. We measured to put the hole dead center, and painter's tape helped to keep the edges clean. We borrowed a four and a quarter inch hole saw to get through the plywood. Dull teeth and underpowered drill required patience, but it did the trick eventually. A similar hole went through the lower section of the front wall panel. Zazal had left some rough edges on the plywood, so Shoyun went on the attack with a knife and a file. <laughs> One advantage of the week's delay was an opportunity to scour the internet, yielding a narrow hollow core door for all of ten bucks on Craigslist. Unfortunately, the door we got was slightly too wide and quite a bit too tall for our booth. The warp in the stud ate up all the wiggle room we should have had. In our original plan, we were going to build a door ourselves, and this wouldn't have been so much of an issue. Cutting a hollow core door shorter is quite easy. Cleanly shaving just a tiny bit off the edge to make it narrower was going to be more difficult. Instead, we chose to modify the front wall section itself. This meant undoing some of the hard work from last weekend, though. Removing screws from plywood and that middle stud... pulling off the plywood, loosening the carpet and cloth staples on that edge, and pulling the reinforcing block from above the ventilation opening. We measured the required distance, and again employed leftover wood to hold the stud in place long enough to get screws driven back in. To our great relief, the door now slid right into the opening. We'd only then have to cut it shorter. I got the store on Craigslist for ten dollars. I think usually at Home Depot it goes for close to a hundred or more, but uh, it's a twenty-four by seventy-eight. Our booth is designed for short people like us, which is, so it only should go up to six feet. We're gonna have to cut at least six inches off. Before that, though, we trimmed a sliver off the reinforcing block as the cavity was now narrower. Double checked the height and secured it with screws this time. Before it was just wedged in place. Cloth and carpet got stapled down once again. The stud had moved so little, we did not need to trim any of the rock wall off. Here, you can more clearly see the loose flap in the canvas and carpet to allow airflow and cable routing. Gentle application of force convinced the mass loaded vinyl to buckle in the other direction, so that didn't need any trimming either. Plywood could drop right back into place, but that did need a trim. There was no way the Sawzall could do so with appropriate finesse, so Shoyun grabbed the hammer and a chisel and painstakingly carved a narrow strip of material loft to ensure fitment and a clean edge. If we'd had enough material left over, completely replacing the plywood would have been much faster, even with aligning screws and cutting another four and a quarter inch hole. With the front wall prepped, it was time to trim the door itself. We measured to cut off slightly more than six inches for a close but interference-free fit in the frame. Just as before with the hole saw, we added painter's tape to both sides to keep the edge of the cut clean. Clamps and more scrapped wood formed a guide, as the material of the hollow core door is quite flimsy and the sawzall blade could wander. Circular saw would have been a better choice if we had one available this time. If the blade contacted the board directly, the saw was sliced into the guide. Instead, we measured the width of the saw foot and clamped the guide so the foot could rest flat on the door and would slide down the edge of the board instead. The cut came all to right, little bit of wobble, but it would work. Time to rip and tear the part we cut off, our prize, the piece of wood at the very top. Lots of glue and cardboard residue, so we went after it with file and sandpaper. <laughs> yeah, that happened to me too. 
At the top of the shortened door, we carefully broke the internal cardboard bracing a little ways down to make room for the piece of wood again. Fitment remained a problem, so I changed the strategy to a chisel was in order. A wood plane would have been faster, but the glue came off all the same. Once we had confidence the pieces would fit, we applied wood glue to both sides of the edge closest to the door. That way, it would get smeared into the gaps during assembly. Gentle taps with the hammer encouraged the piece to go together. A small amount of excess glue dripped out, and a sheet of newsprint beneath kept the carpet safe. It smells like forbidden Elmer's glue. <laughs> Cleanup is easy with a damp paper towel while this type of glue is wet, but once it's cured, it's impervious to water and must be sanded off. We propped the door up to keep it from sticking to anything, then clamped it using two bits of scrap wood to spread the force. The glue calls for at least 30 minutes of clamp time and 24 hours for full cure, assuming reasonable temp and humidity. Daylight was fading, so I let the glue cure overnight. Next morning, it was time for hinges. Dimensions of the shortened door were fortunate that we did not need to chisel new hinge mounting points. It's a very light door, so it only ever had two hinges in total. New hinges were a different size than the old one, so we marked out an outline and where the screws would go. Then we drilled small pilot holes, as per the instructions. Pay attention to hinge orientation and door direction when installing. We came very close to putting them on backwards. Putting the front wall back was a bit more of a struggle, as some things might have shifted or warped again when we modified it. A small amount of mallet encouragement was required. Off camera, we widened the bolt holes to allow easier fitment. Contrary to the front wall and bolts, the door and hinges fit right into the frame. Not too tight and not too loose. Except for a bit of plywood where the hinges protruded. We marked the hinge heights with the door sitting in place, propped off the threshold by a strip of carpet to prevent it binding. Then, Shoyan carved out slots with a chisel, which also did well on the mass loaded vinyl. Lower hinge got the exact same treatment. Holding the door steady with bottom edge propped on a piece of 2x3 and carpet again, we drilled two pilot holes, one at the top and one at the bottom. Then we tacked the door in place with one screw in each hinge to check the fitment. Everything worked out, so we drilled the rest of the pilot holes and secured remaining screws. It's adorable. Time was running out for construction, as a move was two weeks and one weekend away at this point. The booth still needed lighting and a latch for the door. We got a neutral white LED strip light kit. It came in a 32 foot long roll. <laughs> Whole lot of light there, almost 50 watts in total. We fed the power cable out through the top vent hole and did a mock up. then drilled half-inch holes to keep the strip away from anywhere it could get pinched. We started with one wrap, using painter's tape to keep it there for testing. When one proved too dim, we drilled a second set of holes and fed another round through. Much better. The strips had adhesive backing, though peeling the backing plastic off in the confines we had to work with proved a bit challenging. Extra length got chopped off at a designated point. In the case of this 24 volt strip, it could be trimmed every 6 LEDs. We'd also picked up a doorknob at the same time. Shall we unhandle most of that assembly?
Putting the knob in the door was easy. Setting up the latch plate took more concentration. But the grease on the latch helped with alignment as it marked the door frame at the correct height we needed. <laughs> we used hammer, chisel, and drill to carve enough of a divot to allow the latch to operate. At the time, we simply made sure the door would latch without installing the latch plate. The forces on it were light enough to not risk any damage in the short term. The booth was now in a usable state. As part of testing during the next week, Shoni recorded some of her vocals and I did the voiceover for the Top Vision Jumpstarter video. Move-in day was upon us before we knew it, a bit too frantic for any video of the move itself. Only after a few days of settling in did we get around to putting the booth together. Two remaining scraps of carpet got sewn together to form a floor pad. Got to try some of the funkier patterns the machine could do to make a strong sure. seam. No, what do you think? No, I guess this is in the back. 27. No. Uh, no! I'm <laughs> trying to die. I'm trying to make it a little less visible. Uh, what stitch do we use? <laughs> oh, piece 30. After debating on where we wanted the booth, we settled on the corner of the living room. This put it as far from the neighbor's shared walls as we could get on the exterior corner of the apartment. All the sections were scrambled, needing some shuffling around to get them set up. The nice clean apartment walls would proudly display any damage, adding to the stress. Each segment weighs about 60 pounds and can be cumbersome to maneuver. Getting the first two sections together was the iffiest part. Once that joint secure, the assembly was self-supporting and subsequent walls were easier to deal with. Still took some care to guide all bolts into the holes without binding. Larger holes helped with the alignment and yarn helped keep the bolts in place, but this was not foolproof. Labels helped enormously, as each wall could only go one place. Carpet and cloth acted as a gasket as the sections clamped together, providing a good seal without extra sound dampening material on the outside of the corners. The bolts got tightened in stages to prevent undue stress on the assembly. The front panel gave us some trouble again, and I had to use pliers to keep that upper left bolt from retreating so far we could not get a nut on the threads. At last we got all six fed through and could clamp the front wall down. Finally, we got around to installing the door latch plate. Everything lined up for reliable open and close. For the ventilation, I pulled out a computer fan and 12 volt power supply I had lying around. Well, I got that wired up, Shoyun finished hand sewing the carpet on the booth lid together. The fan and the light power cable couldn't share the hole, so we notched out a place for the cable to keep it clear. Screws were just barely long enough, but the fan would stay in place and move plenty of air. The door added a new element to the lid installation, but it was light enough for me to lift overhead and pass over the top to show you an inside. Then we'd slide it back until it settled. It's still a bit crooked, but it seems to work okay for our needs. A three-way outlet splitter and an extension cord got power up top for the two power supplies. 24 volt lights and 12 volt fan means we couldn't share a power brick. But after all that work, the fan transmitted a very noticeable resonance through the lid. Not bad when the lid was on the ground, but a big problem when installed. 
Instead, we changed our strategy to have the fan blow air in through the bottom vent hole. A small piece of leftover carpet became a vibration isolating collar, held in place with zip ties. One small block of wood to support the fan, and a generous helping of painter's tape to secure the prototype. The carpet air duct allowed a computer power cable to enter without fouling the fan blades. Fan noise problem solved, for now, with enough airflow to keep the booth from getting hot or stale. Now for furniture and equipment. Tiny table. Microphone interface. Laptop and mouse. Mic and stand. And a collapsible stool to sit on. With everything arranged how we wanted, we set up a decibel meter to test the booth's sound damping. We took two distance measurements and a height measurement so we could replicate the meter placement any time in the future. We set a Bluetooth speaker in the booth as a remote control sound source, feeding it with a tone generator app on Shoyun's phone. Testing was done in an A-B format, taking a reading with door open, then a second reading with the door closed, and repeating for each frequency. We used 500, 1000, 2000, 4000, and 8000 Hz. Automatic gain on the camera means loudness is not accurately represented in the audio tracks. As expected, lower frequencies were harder to attenuate. Most of the leakage appears to be coming around the door, which fits alright but does not yet have any sort of gasket. First round of tests, we pointed the speaker at the door, and later repeated with the speaker facing away from the door as a vocalist inside the booth would. Lacking a studio monitor with required output at the frequency ranges we needed, we used Shoyun's phone to get more top end for the second round. Definitely warrants further testing with a more capable sound source further down the road. Take the data with a grain of salt, or maybe a whole pinch of salt. With the speaker facing outward, we got one heck of an outlier at 2000 Hz, while the rest of the data points behaved as expected. Extrapolating the 500 and 4000 Hz values gives a more sensible curve. Meanwhile, with the speaker facing away, the numbers behaved much better, and the two curves ended up looking quite similar. The door matters less in this case, as the walls are doing most of the work before the sound even makes it in that direction to escape. As a final test, we put our vacuum cleaner inside the booth to provide loud, broad-spectrum noise. Very good attenuation here, both qualitative and quantitative. There's more improvements we'd like to do eventually, but for our current needs, the booth is plenty functional. Hi there! Thanks for making it to the end of the video, I really appreciate it. Check down below in the description for social media links, check the end card for something else you might be interested in watching, and see you next time.